Good morning. Welcome to Cross Point Church. Man, I'm so glad you're here today. Thank y'all for being a part. Like a part. No, just kidding. Thank y'all for being a part of what's going on. That was my COVID joke. Thank you. Thank y'all for being a part. Uh, just so glad that you're here. Glad that you made the journey to be a part of this and to know that God will and wants to bless our time together. Uh, real quick reminder, I told Jesse to make this announcement, but he didn't make it down here. So um, we are starting to sanitize in between services. So I'm not trying to rush you out, but as soon as the first service is done, if you can make your way out the door so that we can be sure and get the room sanitized for our second service. Uh, you guys are already pre-sanitized. So we've got, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a spiritual sense at some point in time. <laughs> the pre-sanitation and the post-sanitation, it's all biblical and scriptural. Uh, anyway, but we're sanitizing the room, so you're welcome to stay, talk a little bit, any of that. You just have to do it outside the room unless you want to get hosed down while you're in here, which is cool. I mean, that's completely up to you. But man, I'm so glad you're here. Let's all stand. We're just going to pray and thank the Lord for his goodness and mercy on us this week. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for who you are. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. And God, just everything you are doing in the life of our church, may you be glorified and lifted up and praised. And may we glorify you in everything that we say and do. Amen.
Good morning. How's everybody this morning? Well, that's kind of good. Right? All at the same time. Good, average, somewhat above average, a little over, I don't know. So glad that you're here. It's a little cool, a little damp, a little, bleh, but it's going to get nicer. It's going to get nicer. Love fall. Who loves fall? 
Yes. How many people are born in the fall? Okay, usually, I've heard this. I don't know if it's true. It is for me. But whatever season you're born in, that's usually your favorite season. If that's not true for you, sorry. It's just something somebody said. Anyway, so glad you're here. Welcome if you're watching online as we continue in Liberty and Justice for All and uh, a series that has been so good uh, in looking at the book of James and just so much wisdom to unpack here. And uh, today we're going to talk about a message entitled Closer. Closer. And sometimes you need to just get closer to God. Sometimes you need to get closer to the things you're working on. Sometimes you need to get closer to those in your home. And then there's sometimes we need to do that, and then we don't do that. And we need to look at the root of why we don't do that sometimes. So this morning, we have some questions to start us out with the things that we try to investigate when there's an issue. When people are having an argument or in a Marital relationship, sometimes we call it heated fellowship. Priscilla Shire, thank you for that word. Heated fellowship. We want to see what was the cause. And looking back, it's like, I don't know. All I did was get out of the car. I don't know. How did I mess that up? I don't know. And then maybe your spouse says, well, you should have stayed in the car. And then we wouldn't have had this argument. So, But we ask the question, what's going on here? You know, law enforcement, when they roll up somewhere, they say, hey, how are you? What's going on? And maybe there's a a domestic dispute, and they investigate that and say, hey, what can I do to help? What's going on here? And remember from last week, jealousy and selfish ambition are not honorable. Remember we talked about that, that wisdom that comes from God that we seek Jealousy and selfish ambition are not from God. And we would never say, we would never say, hey, you know, I, I have a lot of jealousy and I'm, I'm kind of a selfishly ambitious person and I'm proud of it. Who would say that? Okay, don't raise your hand if you would. Don't say that. But we, we don't, in seeking peace, and last week we found out that being peace-loving people and being gentle at all times, that's what we're called to do. But that jealousy and selfish ambition are not honorable. I saw something yesterday that made me think that is the perfect picture of what God must see in us sometimes. So I have chickens, and I went out to feed the chickens, and I don't have like 200,000 like some of y'all have, like these big houses with this ton. I have like seven, all right? Seven. So I went to feed my, my chickens on the chicken farm, the poultry farm I have. And so I go to feed them, and there's this coop. Now picture this. And the door's always open because they're inside a chain-link fence, and so they're under maximum security. So they're like, got two things. But the coop door stays open, and it, and it swings open. So you've kind of got this V right here with the door, and you've got an open walkway. The door is wide open. So I go to feed them, and five go straight through the doorway. Two are over here, and they go right into where the door is open, right to the hinges. And they're like, <laughs> and I'm like, you can't get through there. What, what are you doing? You, there's no possible way. They don't back up and go around the door. They just keep flying. They keep jumping, and one jumps over the other, and I'm just sitting there watching this whole thing going, hello. No wonder you're not like, you know, just bald eagles or something. You're chickens. So I pour out all the feed, and the others are all around the feeder, and they're just having the biggest time. And I look back over, and they're still, same place, Hmm, just running. And I'm thinking, what? And then it just hit me. You know, God is like, hey, right here's what I have for you. Follow my path and you get it. And what do we do? (sighs) I know my best way. I know the way, Lord. 
I know the way, sorry, that was way over the top, but it just happens. I don't know. So thank goodness this is live. Um, so, but they just keep jumping right into that fence in the door. And I'm like, whatever. So I, literally it was five minutes. I just stood there. And finally I said, okay. And I went around there, pull the door open a little bit, pick them up. Toss them through the gate. They go over there and eat. And they're like, not even a thank you. Not one thank you. <laughs> Didn't even look back. But I had to pick them up and set their feet on the right path. And I thought, that's what God does to you. That's what he does to me. We think we got it. We think we know. And we just keep jumping right into the door, right into the fence. Not knowing after a while that fence is going to begin to hurt us because it's going to cut them. It will cut those chickens. They keep flapping. They're going to get something hung. They're going to be hurt if there's not a rescue. And that's what God does for us. He rescues us. You see, there's motives Inside, just like with those chickens yesterday, they, some that recognized they went straight around and they were the first one in. They were like, here comes the food. I'm going to be first. I'm going to be getting there. I'm going to get it. Don't care that I might get stepped on. Don't care that I might get under his feet. I know what's coming. I want what's coming. I want to be right there when it happens. So I'm going to be in place when it happens. Instead of having this selfish ambition of I'm going to be first even though I'm right in here at the door and I'm going to keep jumping. Their goal was to be first. And their goal was to try to get in there, but they couldn't. And sometimes we have those selfish ambitions and that jealousy. And sometimes we have these desires in our hearts that cause us problems. And that's what we're going to look at this morning. Chapter 4, the book of James Verses 1 through 10. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Pay attention right here, verse 3. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. Let that sink in. Because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. You adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom Instead of joy, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Not just that he would lift you up, he will lift you up in honor. Would you pray with me? Father, as we look at your word, 
and unpack it for just a few minutes. God, I pray you would just pierce hearts. God, that you would just move as only you can. God, I pray you'd just speak through me and in spite of me this morning. That we might hear directly from you. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, what's the problem? That's usually the question, isn't it? What's the problem? We walk up into our children are having some heated fellowship or we have something going on. We say, ah, what is going on there? And you go in, what's the problem? What's the problem? First question. And then two or three people, all of a sudden, at the same time, well, and then, and, I, and it will, well, we have to slow everybody down, don't we? Then, who started it? That's always a great question. Only one person will speak at a time if you ask who started it, right? <laughs> it's like, well, then you, you, who started it? Not me. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, you did. No, I didn't. They did. I, there you go. Round two, and you're standing right there watching it. Who started it? Because what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? So who started it? The evil desires at war, those things that just keep us going back and forth. It's within who? It's within you. And it's within me. And these things that keep our mind just at war with good and evil and Satan trying to trap us. And we know he is roaming about the earth seeking whom he may devour. Planting little seeds. Taking little jabs. But it's within you. It's within me. Now, what will we say? Not me. Not me. Not me? Yeah. Me. You see, it says, don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? Yeah, here it is. You want. Okay, stop right there. You want. I want. We what? All the time, we what? Do we ever have a time that we say in our lives, you know what? I don't want anything. I don't want anything to eat or drink. I don't need any more money. I don't need any more vehicles. I don't need any more patio furniture. But it's on sale with the Christmas stuff. It's on clearance. I don't need any more whatever you fill in the blank with. We rarely say that. Most of the time we say, hey, I saw this, and you know, I, I want to get, before we know it, we saw. Because it used to be that when I was a child 318 years ago, Cereal commercials were the biggest thing on. Like it was all, when you're watching cartoons, when cartoons were real and Bugs Bunny and Tom and Jerry and the Roadrunner was always getting, you know, smashing Wile E. Coyote and it was, now it's too violent, I know. But maybe that's what's wrong with me. But those were the things. It was just the cereal commercials and then it became the toy commercials and then all that, and now it's the same. Except for now... To keep our two or three year old calm for a moment, we let them watch a video. And then guess what? They interrupt the video so they can bring you what? A commercial. You watch a video on your phone, on the computer, there's a commercial. We are inundated with that. And so that just makes more desire for material things, which makes us want even more the things that cause us issues. Is there anything wrong with 
having lots of stuff? No. Is there anything wrong with making a great living? No. But the desire, when it is selfish or it is because someone else and it is jealous, that's where the problems come in. Because we have sometimes a whatever-it-takes mentality. You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war to take it away from them. You know, sometimes we see shirts. A lot of sports companies have a shirt, whatever it takes, right? Whatever it takes. And sometimes we move that into our personal world, whatever it takes. To get what I desire, to make me happy. When if you had nothing but those people around you, that would be enough. We live in in such a time that everything is so electronic it is so fast paced it is so much if you don't have this I mean 4G is not enough it's just not we need 5 and I just want to say sometimes you think I'm going to settle for 5G when there's going to be 10G huh bring it bring me the 10G right now oh wait There's a law in sales, in case you didn't know it, for iPhones right now. Did you know that? Because everyone's waiting till they're 5G compatible. I've done some research on this, and here's what I've come up with. Who cares? So, I want a flip phone. That would make my life simple. I just want to get back to... You know, a rotary dial, when it takes you a while, you just enjoy the call, right? It's like, hmm. But those things keep pushing us until we're at the place, whatever it takes. No, it's whatever he says. How about that? It's not whatever it takes to get what you want. It's whatever he says I need to do to live the life he's given me, he's blessed me with. To be who he's called me to be. Not what I want. I think that's the problem sometimes is we get so wrapped up in what we want. Lord, I love you. Thank you for saving me. Now, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I need you to do because I want. How about let's be content and do what he says. You know, before things kind of went sideways growing up with my parents, and I would ask my mom something, and I'd already asked my dad, and he said no, so I'd go to my mom. Anybody ever do that? Right? Yeah. And my mom would always tick me off because she'd say, what'd your daddy say? And I'm like, oh, oh, I just, oh. And then you're tempted again to lie and say, well, he said it good. So. I mean, but in thinking about where we are, what a great question to ask ourselves. What does your heavenly father say? What does your heavenly daddy say? What, what does he say about your desires and what you want in life and how you want things to go? Listen, it's so much easier when we say, God, not my will, but thy will. That's hard for us, especially in this day and time. It's whatever he says. It's not whatever it takes. It's whatever he says. He goes on. You are, inje- you are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have you want because you don't ask God for it. We don't ask God for it because then we might have to understand that in asking God for it, we're going to have to say, God, if it's your will for my life versus God, here's what I want. 
And sadly, he is treated like Santa so many times. Here's my list. I'm looking at the world, Lord. The Sears wish list, the wish book came out. And so we have to ask ourselves about our motives. It says, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it and asking him if it's his will. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. So what are your motives? What are your motives? What are, what are the reasons behind what you do? When you wake up in the morning, what are the motives behind what you do? What are the motives behind what you do? First thing is we try to protect the rest of the world. As we go straight to the coffee pot. Ah, ah, I got to have that so I can get going and then I'll be better. But what are your motives? What are your reasons for doing what you do every day, where you go and what you do in life and what you say and the people you come in contact with? What are your motives? Is it to get ahead? Is it to have more? Is it to, to build this uh, better just so you can have more? What is it? Because your motives become your motivation. Now think about that. Your motives become your motivation. The reasons you are doing something then become what motivates you all the time. And if they are for worldly things, if they are for pleasure alone, then that is your motivation. Your reasons for doing it. And your motivation molds your mindset. Your motivation molds your mindset. And your mindset is what you think about and the reasons that you do what you do and the decisions that you make and the reactions that you have are molded by your motivation. And let that sink in. And we're, this is like an onion this morning. We're just peeling back layers till we get down to it, right? Deep down, what is it? That motivates you? What is it that has molded your mindset in this life? So we probably need to talk about our motives. It says, and even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Does it say there are things in this life you should not enjoy? No. You want only what will give you pleasure. You want only what will make you feel good. That's what he says. And then he says, verse 4, you adulterers. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Huh. Didn't know it's still cut and dried. I say it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. So ask yourself about your motives. Are your motives for your pleasure or are they pure? We don't really stop. Think about this. How many times a day do we stop and ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Only when we're usually in the middle of muck and mire and we're just worn out with it. We're like, why am I doing this? Why do I keep doing this? I just need to do something different. And in our small group lesson this past week, it was talking about Going from 
uh, you know, one thing to the next. You go, you know, like if somebody goes from one job to another job to another job to another job or one relationship to another relationship to another relationship to another relationship to another friend to another friend to another friend to another friend. And all of a sudden they're just like, you know what? I don't know. These friends, are just, they all turn out the same. Every boss I get does me like this every time. I don't know why these people I select to be in a relationship with are always like this. And then there's one common denominator in all that, right? It's you. (laughs) It's you that is in all those situations. It is me. It is us that we are in those same things. And we go, it's just the same thing. I don't get why people are like that. We never stop to go, you don't think it could be me, do you? And then we might think that, we might say that, and then we go, nah, it's just a messed up world. It's just a messed up world. But our motives, folks, matter. Our motives matter, and they matter to God. So are your motives for your pleasure, or are they pure? Are the motives behind your desires worldly or godly? Worldly or godly? Because once we get those in order, then things begin to happen. Things begin to happen. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is compassionate. Is passionate, rather. That the spirit he has placed within us should be what? Faithful to him. That's in everything we do. We are to be faithful to him. And he gives grace, how? Generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Think about it. Friend or enemy? If I said, how many of us are enemies of God? Raise your hand if you're an enemy of God. Nobody is going to raise their hand if you are. I'm backing up. (laughs) We want to be a friend of God, but we can't be friends with the world and a friend of God at the same time. Very clear. Very clear. The key thing we need to take from that right there is to be faithful. Be faithful. Faithful. The scriptures say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be what? Faithful to him. He doesn't want us to be faithful part of the time. We're to be faithful to him. Our motives should be pure. When people get married, they don't say, and I hope I can be faithful most of the time. Hello, anybody awake this morning? Nobody says, well, I promise to be faithful at least 50% of the time. And they don't look each other in the eye and go, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no. Either, it's either you're faithful or you're not. You're in or you're out. So that spirit he's placed within us desires that we are faithful to him. We should be faithful to him. And then he gives grace generously. We're to be faithful to him, do the very best we can do. We're not going to get it right. We're all sinners. We all fall short. However, he gives grace generously. And I thank him for that. Be faithful, though it's hard. It's never easy in this. This life is not going to be easy, and it's not going to get easier. But be faithful, though it's hard. Receive his generous grace. Receive his generous grace. Why is that so hard? Why is it so hard to receive his generous grace?
Maybe it's because we think, I just asked for grace like 10 seconds ago. Lord, I'm so sorry, Lord. I just, I messed up again. And it wasn't 30 minutes ago. I just said, I'm so sorry. Forgive me for that. And then I walk into this office and I had this conversation. Ah, I blew it again. He gives his grace generously. Receive it. Receive it. He says, so humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee. So how do we get that grace? We have to be humble. It says, he opposes the proud. The I got it under control crowd. I can handle it crowd. The hey, I'm in it to win it. It's all about me and mine. I can take care of it. I'm good. Until I need some forgiveness and, and somebody needs a prayer, then I'm going to pray and then I'm going to... No. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace, sufficient grace, by the way, to the humble. He says, so humble yourselves before God, then what? Resist the devil. If we truly humble ourselves before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That devil's just on me all the time, Pastor. Really? How much resisting are you doing? <laughs> How much humbling yourself before God are you doing? How much praying that he would flee and be bound in Jesus' name are you doing? Well, he's just, he just, he knows how to get me. What? I have heard that before. And I was much more professional, but sometimes I just want to say, what? Like Dennis Swanberg used to say, he said, I, I have counseled people before. Great comedian, godly man. He said, I've counseled people before. He said, I just did it one time. He said, I only had one counseling session. He said, and they both told me what was going on. And I just looked at him and I said, well, stop it. <laughs> he said, that was the end of the session. <laughs> well, well, that's pretty good advice. <laughs> but how much resisting do we do? We, we don't, we, we're, we're easy prey many times. Well, I, I struggle with alcohol or I struggle with this or I struggle with that. I struggle with alcohol, but I'm going to go in here and eat at lunch. They have the best sandwiches. I know it's a bar. I know they only had seating at the bar. But I struggle with alcohol, and both guys beside of me were drinking, so I just thought I'd just have one. It's 9 a.m. You walked in. The, you see what I'm saying? For me, that was a struggle. And for me, I had to say, no, I can't be around it. And I'm sorry, you're not my friend, and you're not my friend, and no, I can't go here for the longest time until I had no more issue with it. We have to humble ourselves Resist the devil. And if we do those two things, what does he say will happen? He will what? Flee. He can't stand the name of Jesus. And he can't stand in the presence of Jesus. So claim in Jesus' name, I resist you. I rebuke you. You are bound. You are out of my face. I am humbling myself before God and asking him to keep you away from me. And he will flee. Humble yourselves and resist the devil. You are as close to God as you want to be. You realize that? You are as close to God as you want to be. And you might say, well, I just, I've been in church, but I just don't feel it. Listen. Listen. The presence of God is not an emotion. It's a stirring of the Holy Spirit in your heart where you know He is there and you are seeking Him and you are reading and you are praying. You know, in marriage, after you've been married 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, as one couple in our community was just married, celebrated their 62nd anniversary. 62nd anniversary. And you know what they did? They were both at work at Johnson's. 
meal. They were both at work. They were like, hey, here we go. But you know what? On those 15th year, the 20th year, the 60th year, you typically don't come in the door and go, hey. (laughs) Do we? Do we do that? After we've been married a while, they, they know we love that we love each other, but it's, it's different. It's a more mature relationship. It's you know that I love you, and I'm going to do these things to show you that I love you. It's not that, oh, we're going to get married because we're in love. Well, you can write love and draw a heart on the power bill. Guess what? It's still going to be late. <laughs> it's still going to be unpaid. When it gets there and they go, there's no check, but we're in love. Well, you have to work on that. You have to work on that. But it's a relationship. It's a relationship with God. You're as close as you want to be. Because he says, he says, verse 8. So simple, so simple. Come close to God and he will come close to you. What? Wait a minute. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wait a minute. Is that simple? Yes, it is. But if we're constantly trying to to make excuses and decisions based on why we're not where we need to be, why we're not doing what we need to do for the Lord, why we are not fulfilling His will for our lives and, and seeking our own, then we're not going to be as close. Because here's what we need to do, church. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Now just stop and think about your life right now. Think about your week this past week. How much time was spent in the world and on the world versus in the word and close to God. In prayer and close to God. In worship and close to God. Seeking out who he might have you help along the way this week. We're as close to God as we want to be. He says in verse 9. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Who's signing up for that today? Woohoo! Sorrow, tears, gloom. But it's to humble ourselves. It is to say, Lord, I'm sorry I have been a part of this world and not for you. I'm sorry I've been a friend of the world and an enemy of you. I want to be your friend and an enemy of the world. I have to be in this world, but I don't have to be of it. See, divided loyalty is disloyalty. We can't be loyal to God if we're loyal to the world. And how did he say to do it? Humility, tears, sadness, sorrow, grief, gloom. It means actually getting real with God and saying, I'm going to get on my face. I am so sorry, God. I love you and I want what you want for me. I want what you want out of me in this life. Use me. And if you pray that and you say, God, I want you to use me, get ready. Because he will. And it will cost you something. But it is so worth it. It is so worth it. So truly humble yourselves before the Lord. And he will lift you up. And he will lift you up and out. Lifting you up is lifting you out of where you are. He will lift you up and out. Hallelujah. 
Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. And how will he lift you up? In honor. But I'm not honorable, Pastor. You don't know what I've done. Guess what? Praise God, you don't know what I've done. But you don't know where I've been. Praise God, you don't know where I've been. I walk where you walk every day. I have walked on this earth. I have been a part of this world in my life. And I am so glad I no longer am. But how do we get out of that? How do we get this off of us? We have to let it go and accept that generous grace that he so freely gives. But you got to humble yourselves. you got to get real. You hear that a lot, right? He's going to keep it real. I'm going to keep it real for you. I'm going to tell you what's what. I'm going to tell you how it is. I'm going to let you know where it is because I'm going to keep it real. But I'm not going to keep it real before God. Because that will involve me telling the truth about me and where I've been and what I've done. And I don't like that. So I want to challenge you this morning to get real and keep it real before God. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray this morning in the strong name of Jesus that, God, you would move as only you can among your people. I pray, God, that you would have your way and your will. Lord, I pray that you would move people this morning to truly, truly humble themselves before you. Lord, with pain and with sorrow and gloom and tears, that you might lift us up out of that. You might lift us up in honor, as your word says. That if we draw close to you, you will draw close to us. God, have your way and your will this morning in this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand, please? I want to challenge you to make your way this morning. Make your way and say, God, I want to walk in a different way when I leave this place this morning. God, I want my children to see something new in me this morning. I want my grandchildren to see something different. You make your way. You make your way. church make your way
Amen. Amen. Uh, before we go, and I know we need to move out of here so we can get started uh, with what we need to do to get ready for next service. But I think it's very important that we take a moment that I read this scripture. And that I challenge you. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 7.14 then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven. And I will forgive their sins and restore their land. It says in verse 15, my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to every prayer made in this place. Talking about the temple. Every prayer. I know you know what's going on in our country. And I know you know there is a battle. And I challenge you to understand. And you can like what I say. I really don't care. But it is a spiritual battle. It is evil. And there is a decision and there is a choice. There again, I'm not getting into politics. You got a Bible. You're grown people. But I want to challenge you to pray for our country. And I want to pray for us, and then I'm going to be done. And I'm going to let Jesse come share some announcements, but I just believe it is so vitally important that we pray corporately this morning for our nation. Father, I pray in the strong name of Jesus. God, who shed his blood for our sins. Lord, we are a nation of sinners. But Lord, we are a nation of believers. Those founding principles from our forefathers were based on faith. God, I pray you hear our prayer. God, I pray we would humble ourselves and that you would heal our land. God, unite us. Lord, we love you. And we thank you and we praise you for what you're going to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And thanks, Pastor. A couple things quick before you leave. One, um, you'll notice the, the offering bucket's on the way out. You guys, your generosity is what fuels this whole operation, and we're grateful for it. Last night was Halloween, you know, and I got a four-year-old girl. We did a lot of trick-or-treating, you know. Came home with a giant bucket of candy, and I put her to bed. I said, hey, how about Daddy... You know, I walked about nine miles in this neighborhood. How about, how about Daddy gets a piece of candy? She says, it's all mine. And so then I gave her a preacher dad lecture about how there's not one thing that you got that God didn't give you so that you could use it to turn around and bless somebody else, Caroline. I said, now, I said, how about give me a piece of that candy? Truth is, what I said to her is exactly right, right? Everything that God gives us that's any good at all, he intends for us to turn around and use it to bless other people. When you give here, that's what we do. We want to spread the gospel. We're grateful for that. Some of you give it online already, uh, but you can do that every week. It's secure. It's right there at the back, back in the little black bucket. You can just drop them right in there. Thanks for your generosity. Also, uh, right here where Pastor Chris is standing, hold up a box, Pastor. There you go. It just looks like the price is right. There he is. <laughs> Vanna White, y'all, you know Vanna White from Conway, South Carolina. She, she's about, you know, she's like seventy-five years old. I don't know. She's been on TV a long time. Those boxes are due back on November the fifteenth, and uh, so you got time to do that. We got plenty of boxes over there. Go pick one up, bring them back by November the fifteenth. Don't forget, Jeff mentioned at the beginning, we got our little Ghostbusters machines. We're going to use Holy Ghostbusters, Amen. We're going to we're going to use thanks, Jeff. <laughs> thanks for the courtesy laugh there. We're going to spray this room down, sanitize the room, make sure that you guys are as safe as possible in between services for the next service. So thanks you for for helping us out with that. We love you guys. Do pray for our country. You're dismissed. See you next week.